MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. We have a lot of information today that we want to get to. We're going to talk today about what's going on with the virus. We're also going to talk about risk assessments, specifically the 2.86 variant known as Parola, and the recent statement from the CDC in terms of potential increased infection rates in people who have been vaccinated or have had previous infection and what that actually means. We're also going to talk about some new data that's come out that's not peer-reviewed yet, but goes over the efficacy of the boosters that are supposed to be coming out this fall in regards to the current variants that are circulating around. So let's get to it. The first thing I want to do is look at the prevalence of the virus. And for that, we don't even go to testing anymore because it's so inconsistent now. What I like to go to is wastewater. And so this is coming from Biobot Analytics, and I give you the link in the description below that's looking at wastewater. So where are we right now? We are right here in this area, and you can start to see that wastewater detection is going up. It's not as high as it was earlier in January of 22, but you can see here if we zoom into this, in the last six months, we're looking at a pretty steady increase in the prevalence of the disease all around the country. So it's really not making much of a difference where you are. There was a little bit of a peak and dip here in the North Midwest, but for the most part, everything seems to be going up at this point. If we look, though, at hospitalization, we also see that both in Canada and in the United States, in terms of relative proportion to the population, we are seeing an increase in hospitalizations as well. And we discussed this in our last update and what we saw in the Utah data, which still showed a benefit in those that were boosted and vaccinated in terms of hospitalizations. But we are seeing an increase, and it's probably because the benefits of vaccination and or infection is wearing off. So how does this translate into people in the intensive care unit? Again, we are in the United States seeing a slight increase now in the number of people who are being admitted to the intensive care unit with COVID-19, not with some other illness and then being tested for it and finding it because they're not doing routine testing anymore. They're only testing really, at least in our hospitals and many others, if there are symptoms specifically of COVID-19. And here, if we look at daily new confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people, we are actually not seeing much of an increase, which is good news. This may be because that T-cell immunity is more broad and robust in terms of the mutations that we're seeing in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it's able to keep up with that. And it's the T-cells that are specifically involved with the severe viral syndromes with SARS-CoV-2, whereas it's the antibodies that that are more responsible for preventing infection. And those seem to be outwitted with further and further mutations. So this is a graph looking at the circulating variants right now in the United States. And you can see here that EG5 is the predominant. If we go down here, we see there's a number of XBBs and then going all the way down to others. Notice on here, we're not seeing 2.86. We're going to talk about 2.86 and it's notable as we'll discuss because it has so many mutations in it that the concern was that this was going to be another antigenic shift, a term that we use often in influenza, that this was so different, yet it's making up very little of any of the types of circulating lineages. So just to be clear, the increase in hospitalizations, in ICU admissions, has nothing to do with BA 2.86. It's something that we were looking at to see whether or not it was going to become something important because it had so many mutations in it. The majority of the infections and hospitalizations that we're seeing are coming from these EG5 variant and the XBB variants. Let's focus in a little bit about what's going on with 2.86, specifically BA 2.86. And we turn to this risk assessment summary for SARS-CoV-2 sublineage BA 2.86, otherwise known as Parola. And this was published by the CDC in August, specifically August 23rd. And it has a number of interesting statements that I wanted to go over. This first one tells us exactly what we were concerned about, and that is that this variant is notable because it has multiple genetic differences from previous versions of SARS-CoV-2. And that is the concern right there, and it's the reason why this got onto the map. Let's show that. 
This is a phylogenetic tree that was published in this non-peer-reviewed journal. If you look at XBB 1.5, which is right here, you will see that that gets a level of about 1.0, and anything that's higher than that is estimated to have an advantage in growth relative to XBB 1.5. You can see it right there. This is 2.86, and as you can see here, it's got a very small circle, which means that we don't have a lot of data, and it's a little bit higher in terms of growth advantage, but you can see all of the other ones here in this tree. You can see why they were so concerned about it, because this is BA2.86, and all of these are the mutations relative to just BA2. This area right here, which is red, is blown up to show you how many mutations there were. And it was felt that all of these mutations could give an advantage to this particular variant, and we could see some issues here. They say here that BA2.86 is a newly designated variant of SARS-CoV-2 that has a number of additional mutations compared with previously detected Omicron variants. Specifically, the genetic sequence of BA2.86 has changes that represent over 30 amino acid differences compared with BA2, which was the dominant Omicron lineage in early 2022. It also has greater than 35 amino acid changes compared with the more recently circulating XBB1.5 which was dominant through most of 2023. This was a major shift. I mean, it was like going from Delta to the Omicron variant. So the question was, was this going to be something new or just another flash in the pan in terms of variants? Another statement that came up in this risk assessment was this one. They said that BA2.86 may be more capable of causing infection in people who have previously had COVID-19 or who have received COVID-19 vaccines. That was probably a very poorly worded statement because it caused a lot of confusion that was picked up on social media. The way that this sentence was phrased, it's kind of ambiguous. They're saying here that BA2.86 may be more capable of causing infection in people who have previously had either COVID-19 or have received COVID-19 vaccines, but they don't say compared to what. If you look at this logically, there are two possible comparisons. Again, we have the statement, BA2.86 may be more capable of causing infection in people who have previously had COVID-19 or who have received COVID-19 vaccines, but compared to what? And one option is more compared to those who have not gotten an infection or a COVID-19 vaccine. There were a number of social media accounts that actually took up that possible option. In fact, some of them just completely eliminated infection and just went with COVID-19 vaccines. Or the other statements, which I believe was the intended statement, and we'll talk more about that, more compared to previous variants of the virus in immune individuals. And I believe that is what it is that we're talking about based on what the statement goes into further here. And let's take a look. So this is later in that risk assessment. They say the large number of mutations in this variant, they're talking about BA2.86, raises concerns of greater escape from existing immunity from vaccines and previous infections compared to recent variants. For example, one analysis of mutations suggests the difference may be as large as or greater than that between BA2 and XBB1.5, which circulated nearly a year apart. However, the virus samples are not yet broadly available for more reliable laboratory testing of antibodies, and it is too soon to know the real-world impacts on immunity. Nearly all the U.S. population has antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 from vaccination, previous infection, or both, and it's likely that these antibodies will continue to provide some protection against severe disease from this variant, and this is an area of ongoing scientific investigation. So again, if we look at what it is, we can say that BA2.86 may be more capable of causing infection in people who've been previously had COVID-19 or have received COVID-19 vaccines compared to previous variants. And the reason there is because this variant is so different than the basis of the immunity to previous variants. So I hope that clears that up. But the CDC does mention here that this is an area of ongoing scientific investigation. Let's take a look at that. There's a couple of studies that came out looking at BA2.86, and I'm happy to say that it's turning out that even though BA2.86 is so different radically in terms of mutations, it's probably going to turn out to be nothing of significance, and I'll show you why. 
This is a study that has not yet been peer-reviewed, but it has been published on the archive website. This is where we got some of the data from that I was talking to you about before. This shows the phylogenetic tree. This shows the mutations. But I want to zoom in on this. There's two things that we're looking at here. There's something called the IC50, which has to do with the minimal inhibitory concentration that knocks out 50% of the function. These are usually looking at monoclonal antibodies, which we're looking at here. And we're also looking at the ID50 titer, which is a surrogate for how many antibodies are circulating in the system that would knock out this virus. A high number up here is not good, but a high number up here is good. So we're looking here at these monoclonal antibodies. And we can see here for BA2, we were able to knock out things like BA2 with bebtelovimab. You can see here that it's got an IC50 of 1%. But with XBB 1.5 and finally 2.86, notice that we don't have really any monoclonal antibodies that'll be very helpful. However, take a look now at the different variants. So we have BA2 before and after the advent of XBB in the population and the resultant antibodies, XBB 1.5, and again, the one that we're looking at here is 2.86. Notice here that even though these antibody titers are low, they're not as low as you would expect to see in someone with absolutely no immunity. With the advent of XBB variants circulating around in the population, people now have higher ID50 titers against BA2.86 than they used to. That shows that BA2.86 may not be as infectious or perhaps virulent, depending on if we see some clinical outcomes, as we might have thought. And here is another paper that's going to be submitted for publication, but it's basically raw data, has not been peer-reviewed as yet. And this was distributed on Twitter, now known as X, and we will put the link in the description below as well looking at neutralizing antibody titers to various different variants in different populations. This is the bivalent booster, the non-bivalent booster population at baseline and at six months with no XBB infection and at month six with XBB infection. So you can see again that when you go from no XBB to XBB, notice that specifically for the BA2.86 titers, that when you have an XBB infection, there is generally a higher neutralization antibody titer, which means that XBB, which is the prevalent strain variant, variant that's going around actually does confer some improved immunity, at least in the lab, against this 2.86 variant. It's turning out that 2.86 is probably going to be just another variant that comes and goes and is not going to be the shift that we were concerned about. And based on that data, that seems to be the consensus that most people are picking up here with this article that was published on September 6th in USA Today. New data says that the latest COVID variant is less worrisome than first imagined. Vaccines are helping protect against it. So let's talk about the data in terms of vaccines. And that leads us into the discussion about the boosters that are coming out this fall and a risk assessment. So we don't have clinical data that's actually published as yet or peer-reviewed. We do have, however, a media release, which I wanted to talk about because this is up-to-date information for people who want to know. And so this was a clinical trial data looking at the newest updated booster from Moderna. This was published on September 6th. And they said here that clinical trial data from research assays confirmed that Moderna's updated COVID-19 vaccine showed an 8.7 to 11-fold increase in neutralizing antibodies against circulating variants, including BA2.86, which is what we were just talking about, EG5, which is the majority variant right now in the U.S. population, and this other FL1.5.1 variants. So before we go on, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that I have no financial relationships whatsoever with any of the vaccine companies or with any pharmaceutical companies. I'm looking to see what the data shows so people can make a decision. The reason why we're going over data here is to make sure that people can make a decision because I believe people should be able to make informed decisions. And saying that something works or doesn't work in no way should be taken to mean that things should be mandated or not mandated. 
There are plenty of things in this world that I believe are good and beneficial, but should never be mandated. So for instance, I believe that a good night's sleep is a great thing. But I will be the last person to say under normal circumstances that we should have a universal curfew. I'm looking at the data so people can make a decision. We're going to talk about the benefits and the risks here. Not only in this press release does Moderna talk about the benefits, we probably need to have more information, but it looks as though after vaccination with the updated booster that is coming out this fall, there was a pretty good antibody response, about tenfold, in terms of neutralizing the most common variants. And remember that this variant that was targeted for this update was the XBB 1.5 They knew fully well that 1.5 would probably not be circulating by the time it came out, but they also realized that a lot of the variants would be based on XBB.1.5. In that same press release, they are saying here that post-marketing data demonstrate increased risks of myocarditis and pericarditis, particularly within seven days following the second primary series dose or first booster dose. And we know this from previous studies, and what they're referencing here is probably this study that was published in circulation titled The Risk of Myocarditis After Sequential Doses of COVID-19 Vaccine and SARS-CoV-2 Infection by Age and Sex. This was looking at a massive amount of people. This was almost 43 million people receiving at least one dose of the vaccine and 21 million receiving three doses, 5.9 million having a SARS-CoV-2 infection before or after vaccination. So what they found was that in these mRNA vaccines, there is a risk, albeit small, of myocarditis of 0.007%. What they did was they risk stratified it. So regardless of the fact that this is small, the nice thing here is that they risk stratified it. You can see here the incident rate ratio. And here at the bottom, here we have the AstraZeneca first dose, AstraZeneca second dose. So I'll put AZ1 and AZ2. And as you can see here, hardly any myocarditis whatsoever. Here we also have the AZ booster. And then we go into the Pfizer. So here's the Pfizer first dose. And you can see that there is a signal there. Here's the Pfizer second dose. Again, another signal. Here is the Pfizer booster. That was the booster over there. And you can see that it's a little bit higher. Now we go to the Moderna. So the Moderna first dose, there was a detectable signal there, but it wasn't that high. It was when we got to the Moderna second dose here that we saw the highest level of myocarditis in that population at that time. And then when we go to the booster, interestingly, went back down again. How does this compare with SARS-CoV-2 incident rate ratios? And you can see here that for those who got SARS-CoV-2 and had never had a vaccine dose before, also fairly high myocarditis incidence. Now, those that got SARS-CoV-2 and had been vaccinated, and this here, I believe, may be a misstatement. You can see that there's actually a reduction in myocarditis. So here they've risk stratified it with females on the left and males on the right. We've got less than 40 here at the top and greater than 40 here at the bottom. Let's look at the Moderna second dose because we've already determined that that's the one that has the highest risk according to this study. It's very clear that males less than 40 years of age have the highest risk of myocarditis after vaccination and specifically the second dose of the Moderna. Conversely, whether or not you're female or male over the age of 40, unvaccinated people who get SARS-CoV-2 have the highest rates of myocarditis in this population of over 42 million. Some of you might be saying, well, wasn't there a study in Israel? And this is the study I think that you may be thinking of looking at the incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis in post-COVID-19 unvaccinated patients, a large population-based study. Although a fraction of the population that was used in this previous study, 196,000, and you may be right because they do come up with this statement in their study. They say that post-COVID-19 infection was not associated with either myocarditis or pericarditis. Notice here that their confidence intervals included one, so you could not really say that there was statistical significance. They said, we did not observe an increased incidence of neither pericarditis nor myocarditis in adult patients recovering from COVID-19 infection. A couple of things here. First of all, the statement of the absence of evidence does not equal the evidence of absence. 
it could very well be that compared to 42 million, you might not see a detectable difference with only 196,000. Secondly, notice that they're talking about post-COVID-19 infection, not COVID-19 infection. So they were not looking at the acute infection, but rather well after COVID-19 had already come and in some cases gone. And they say here specifically in the article that they did not include any data from anyone that came down with COVID-19 between day zero and day 10. So if someone develops pericarditis or myocarditis within the first 10 days after a COVID-19 infection, it was not included in this study. They said here that while we study recovering patients starting 10 days after infection, again, in another part of the paper, they say here that diagnostic inpatient codes for myocarditis, pericarditis, were extracted between 10 days and six months. So they did not include anything before 10 days. They also said, as we were considering an indirect immune-mediated inflammation as a potential mechanism explaining delayed perimyocarditis, we reasoned that 10 days after infection is a relevant time point as this is valid with regard to pericarditis after myocardial infarction or cardiac surgery. The key here is that this study may have been underpowered and also blinded to certain cases of myocarditis that they did not include in the study. Looking at the previous study with 42 million plus, this is a good basis for those who may want to consider whether or not they should get boosted this coming up fall. Are they in a situation where they have comorbidities? Do they have heart disease? Are they susceptible to being put into the hospital? Are they in an age group, male under 40, that might give them an increased risk of myocarditis relative to SARS-CoV-2 infection? All of these things are reasonable things that they and their doctor can discuss to decide whether or not they should get boosted. Not to leave out Pfizer, they also have data, and Pfizer-BioNTech has also come out recently with their booster for this fall. It has already been approved in the European Union on September 1st, and there is a meeting in the United States by the CDC coming September 12th to decide how these boosters should be used. Pfizer also put out a warning regarding myocarditis, and you can see that here, specifically referencing that very large 42 million study looking at the observed risk is higher among adolescent males and adult males under 40 years of age. I'll put that link in the description below so you can read that as well. If you are a little bit skittish about taking MRA vaccines because of this or something else, there is also the Novavax. And so Novavax is also coming out with a booster. Of course, it uses different technology. It does not use messenger RNA. And they specifically talk about here, if you're an adult who cannot get or doesn't want mRNA bivalent boosters, the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, adjuvanted is available as a first booster, no matter which primary vaccine you've received. If you are interested in getting boosted against the latest versions of SARS-CoV-2, but you're not thrilled at getting an mRNA vaccine, there is Novavax, which is going to be coming out a little bit later this fall. The reason why it's later is because of the manufacturing process to make that booster. However, according to this report out of New Zealand, there are a small number of cases of myocarditis and pericarditis reported internationally following vaccination with the Novavax product as well. So just realize that nothing is risk-free. So I hope this information has been helpful. We are again looking at all of these cases that are increasing here in the last six months. We're hoping that things start to plateau off and go down, but we are headed into fall and also into winter where there is notably less sunlight. And as I've said before, and I'll say it again, please make sure that you are getting some fresh air, regular exercise, sleep. These are things that you can do to help build your immune system. We've talked about this data for three years now in terms of COVID-19, that getting a good night's sleep is beneficial in terms of antibodies, that not exposing your eyes to light at night is gonna improve melatonin, which is a powerful antioxidant, and that getting outside into fresh air and light is very beneficial for the human body, especially during a COVID-19 infection. 
Well, if you like this video, please subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com where we have all of these videos commercial-free and many more videos that have continuing medical education on various topics like EKG, mechanical ventilation, asthma, and congestive heart failure. Thanks again for joining us.